Welcome to my introduction to networking course, typically abbreviated ITN. This will be for the CCNA version 7 curriculum. Welcome to lesson 7, Ethernet switching. So in this lesson, we're going to be looking at Ethernet frames. We're going to be looking at the MAC address, the MAC address table, and the different ways that a switch will forward data. So remember, Ethernet frames happen at layer 2. They take a packet from layer 3 and they convert it into a data frame, depending on which technology uh, layer 2 is using. This chapter is all about Ethernet, so that's the underlining technology we will be using. Ethernet actually operates at both layer 1 and layer 2. Part of layer 2, the data link layer, it's broken up into two subcategories, LLC and MAC. Important is it uses the IEEE code 802.2 .2 for the LLC, and it uses 802.3, that's the main focus point for Ethernet, for the MAC sublayer and the physical layer. Again, the LLC sublayer, 802.2, .2, it places information in the frame to identify which network layer protocol is being used by the frame. Just like layer 2, it could be different uh, network technologies, layer 3 is the same way we assume that it's going to be IP based. Doesn't have to be. Just like we assume layer two is gonna be ethernet based. Again, it doesn't have to be. The MAC sublayer is 802.3. That's going to be the predominant ethernet. That's the wired connection. If we're talking wireless, it'll be 802.11. If we're talking wireless personal area network, it'll be 802.15. So again, it kind of really just depends. The LLC layer, again, allows higher layer identification, where the MAC sublayer is responsible for data encapsulation, media access, and it provides the data link addressing. And that's going to be our physical addressing. So part of that data encapsulation process is taking a data frame taking a IP packet from layer 3, or whatever layer 3 technology you're using, and we're putting a Ethernet uh, frame together. And that means we're going to have to have the frame header, the overall structure. We have to have the addressing portion. That's going to be our physical addressing. And we have to have some type of error detection. That normally is going to be in the form of a frame check sequence number and that will be used for, again, error detection. So the media access control, again, uses our physical addressing. But depending on the underlying physical connection, whether it's copper, whether it's fiber, it doesn't really matter all that much because IEEE 802.3 is the overall MAC standard and then we have certain subcategories of that, like 802.3U is fast Ethernet. 802.3Z is uh, gigabit over fiber. If we're talking uh, fiber over, sorry, gigabit over copper, it's going to be 802.3AB. So again, Z versus AB, slightly different, both gigabit, but it's over different media because this is going to be what controls access to that media. Legacy Ethernet used a bus topology, point to point, meaning it had to have some way to detect errors because it operated in half duplex. Duplex is actually if you can send and receive at the exact same time or simultaneous. Normally, full duplex is the ability to send and receive simultaneously, Half duplex is one or the other. So when we're dealing with a shared media, we have to have, have some way to detect collisions. So legacy Ethernet has this technology called carrier sensing multiple access collision detection, CSMACD. And essentially what this does is 
it allows for the detection of a collision on the medium. And if it is found that there is a collision, then a hold down timer, a random timer, would be placed so that uh, they would pause transmission and try again at a later time. All gigabit connections are going to be full duplex and Ethernet, when we're using switches, no longer requires CSMA CD because each collision domain is tied per port, not tied to the entire device. CSMA CD was very common when we had hub technology in place instead of switches. All right, moving on is our Ethernet frame. So our frame typically is between 64 and 518 bytes. If it is less than 64 bytes, it is a runt frame. If it is larger than 1518 bytes, it's a jumbo frame. Normally, if we're looking at errors, we're going to be looking at the first 64 bytes because that is where the normal errors would occur. The overall structure for an Ethernet frame is going to be a starting point, some type of preamble. Next will be the destination MAC address. Next will be the source MAC address. Then it will be the type and length of the overall frame. The type will actually dictate what type of layer 3 technology is being used. The data portion of a frame is actually a chunk from layer 3. That could be part of an IP pack or it could be part of a, a packet. The type would actually let you know, is it an IP packet? Is it some other form of layer 3 technology? And we will end with a frame ch uh, check sequence number again for error detection. The nice thing is if a switch is sending a frame and it's too small or too large, then the other switches can drop it. Jumbo frames are usually supported by most fast ethernet and gigabit switches, but you have to have them configured. And again, a jumbo frame is larger than 1500 bytes. 1518 is kind of the limit. Above that would be a jumbo frame. All right, moving on. We have a lab. Labs are going to be explained in other videos. If you look at the description, you will have a playlist to where the labs are. Moving on, 7.2, the Ethernet MAC address. This is our physical address. A Ethernet MAC consists of 48 bits. It is normally expressed using 12 hexadecimal values, ranging between 00 and FF. We've already gone through hexadecimal, so you guys should be familiar with that. It's important to note that an Ethernet MAC address is broken up into two six um, byte uh, groups. So the first six bytes are going to be part of the organizational unique identifier. Basically, IEEE will give you a OUI if you're following their standards. And uh, once they give you that OUI, then you, the vendor, would then randomly generate the last six bytes. So in order to get that first six bytes, you have to follow IEEE standards when it comes to having a, an Ethernet MAC address. So again, when we're looking at this, a physical address is going to be the a connection or an interface connection between some type of hardware and the network. Here we're looking at an Ethernet MAC address, so that means we'll have an Ethernet network interface card, a network card, and that gives us our Ethernet interface to the Ethernet network. So as long as you have an Ethernet interface, you should have a MAC address. So any device that has a Ethernet port will have some form of source MAC address. So how does a frame get forward? We already know that a frame looks at destination and source address information. So what ends up happening is, if I want to send something to another computer on the network, I will actually say who's out there. I will try to figure out who am I sending this to, 
and then I will forward the data accordingly. So essentially, I would have my source information. I would tell the switch I'm trying to connect to someone else out there, and hopefully the person responds. Well, the nice thing is if I don't know the address of who I'm trying to send it to, I can send a broadcast. Basically, it goes to everyone, and the people that don't need to access it will just ignore it. This is called a broadcast, when it's sent to everyone. If I do know who my address is, that's going to be a unicast. So let's look at this a little bit more in depth. A unicast address is going to be a one-to-one, one, one uh, device to another device. Normally, a source will always send it to a single address. Well, the nice thing is that single address can be different types of addresses. If I do not know where I'm trying to send something, I can do what's called a ARP request, a address resolution protocol request. And that is where I know the IP address of what I'm trying to access, but I don't know its physical layer. So I know it's layer three, but not its layer two. So I would send it to the switch. The switch would then allow me to modify my layer two address and it will send it to everyone looking to see who has that IP address. The person that has it, the machine that has it, would actually respond with my MAC address is such and such. Again, the source MAC address will always be a unicast address. Unicast is one to one. A broadcast is one to everyone, to everything. And this is if you want to send something to everything. Well, the nice thing is we have another specialty address that is called a multicast address. I want to send this to a select group of items that like STP. I can send it to all devices that have STP or all devices that have OSPF running. I can send that to a specific group and only those people that have that resource running that is identified by our multicast address group would actually receive that frame. So unicast one to one, broadcast one to everyone, multicast one to some or one to a group. Again, we have a lab, which lab again, we are doing in separate videos. Moving on, we have our MAC address table. So now that we understand MAC addresses, how does the switch use those MAC addresses? And what ends up happening is a switch, when it is powered on, has no known addresses. It has to learn these addresses, and this is typically taken from our source information. So when a device wants to communicate with someone else, it will actually take the source MAC address and it builds a table. This source goes to this port. This destination goes with that port and so forth. The MAC address table is sometimes also referred to as a CAM, Content Addressable Memory Table, a CAM table. Essentially, it's a lookup table. That's really all it is. Again, the switch will do what's called learning. As a switch receives frames, it will actually learn the source and destination to figure out where the ports and what MAC addresses are attached to each port. By default, switches keep this data for about five minutes. And then if no other traffic flows, then the switch will actually delete the content. But as the switch receives more frames, it keeps resetting. If the source MAC address does exist in the table, but on a different port, the switch will treat each new piece of information as new entries. So a switch actually will learn MAC addresses based off of that information. 
and it's dynamic enough to update content as it receives it. So finding the destination MAC address, this is going to be forwarding. So if the destination MAC address is a unicast address, the switch will look for a match between the destination MAC address and its entry table. If it doesn't have it, it will treat it as a broadcast and it'll send it to everyone. Who is this or who is this name or who's this device? And this will be called a unknown unicast frame. Basically, it's similar to a broadcast, except this is defined in a MAC address, not to send data to everything. Unknown unicast, broadcast, and multicast will actually be sent out every port except the port the request came in on. So here's a quick example. We have PCA connected to port 1. We have PCD connected to port 4. As PCA starts communicating, the switch will start learning that port 1 has this MAC address. As it starts delivering data to port 4, it will start learning, oh, port 4, this MAC address belongs. So it can start building its MAC address table based off of that content. Videos and labs again are done separate. Lastly, we have our switching speeds and forwarding methods. There are two major types of forwarding methods, store and forward and cut through. Store and forward basically will take the entire frame and check it against errors. This is slow and causes a delay. Cut through will actually look at the start of the frame once it receives its um, destination portion of its MAC address, it will start forwarding it out uh, from there. It will not check for errors. Cut through actually cuts down on latency because there are certain technologies that latency may cause an issue like VoIP. Anything that requires real-time traffic, store and forward just makes this delayed. So there are issues there. However, an advantage over store and forward is that if it catches an error, because it will take the entire frame, check for errors, if there is an error, it will fix it early on. Where store and forward may actually forward on frames that are actually errored out and not functioning. So there are pros and cons between both of them. So there are some caveats to both of these. So in cut through switching, the switch will act upon the data as soon as it's received. Again, the issue with this is it may forward on uh, data that is corrupt. So there are two variants of cut through switching, fast forward and fragment free. Fast forward switching basically offers the lowest level of latency by immediately forwarding a packet after reading the destination. Fragment free comprised between the high latency and high integrity of store and forward. And it tries to focus on the lower latency and reducing the integrity. So what it does is it looks at the first 64 bytes of the frame because typically that is where the most amount of errors would occur. So there is some give and take. When a switch is overly congested, and there is no way to forward on data. There are two things that can happen. The switch can either drop the frame or it can hold it in its memory. If it holds it in its memory, there's two types of memory it can hold it in, port-based or shared-based. In the port-based memory, basically each port it will have a, a query, a queue, and as data is being uh, lined up to send, it has to wait for the preceding data to actually get there before it can send. If it is shared, the entire switch will actually share data and the switch will compile the data at a level to send out data. Again, with port based, the data that was there first has to be sent and then it will send the next group of data, and then the next, based off of per port. 
We've already talked about duplex and uh, a little bit. So we know full duplex is send and receive simultaneous. Half duplex is one or the other. We know that gigabit has to be full duplex. So let's go ahead and talk about speed. Speed can be done either manually or can auto negotiate. So with speed, we have the ability to set either a 10, 100, 1000 megabits per second and so forth. The auto negotiate portion has to be there so that both sides of the cable can figure out what speed to operate, just like within our full duplex versus half duplex. Both sides have to operate at the same time. So that auto negotiation can actually set duplex and our speed. It just kind of depends on our functionality. What are we trying to accomplish? One of the last major things we have to talk about while talking about switching is this auto MDIX. With auto MDIX, it will take what is a standard cable, a straight through cable, and allows us to connect two switches. Normally, like devices would use a crossover connection. However, auto MDIX can actually flip one side of the connection to ensure communication can flow. And that is it for this chapter. We talked about things like uh, what makes up our data link layer. We talked about what makes up a MAC address. Uh, we talked about uh, frame sequence numbers. We talked about the LLC versus MAC address and how they function. We talked about how the switch makes its forwarding decisions. Uh, how the switch builds its MAC address table, about uh, shared memory versus port memory, and we talked about our speed and duplex settings. And that is it for this chapter. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out and let me know. Thank you.